Hello there and welcome to this Code Rage session. My name is Stephen Ball and I'm going to be taking you through this deep dive into change views. Now change views allow us to deliver some insanely efficient data updates across the wire to remote devices. Um, change views are really making a huge difference in the way that architects are looking at structuring their applications, especially around IoT and around mobilization and still has many considerable benefits for uh, above and beyond some of the traditional replication type of approaches as well. So say my name is Stephen Ball, I'm the Associate Product Manager at Embarcadero. Uh, I specifically look after Interbase, um, uh, so I have sole responsibility for that on the product team. Uh, if you'd like to catch up with me then feel free to contact me through Twitter at Delphia Ball or through my blog which is delphiaball.co.uk uh, or you can email me at stephen.ball at embarcadero.com uh, If you are watching this live then please go ahead and use the chat window uh, where we're doing live Q&A at the end um, but also we'll be fielding questions as they arise uh, as we're going through so feel free to go ahead and post your questions in. So let's get straight into it and I'm going to pretty much ask the, answer the first question that everyone's thinking right now. What is a change view? Well, change views is a subscription based model. Uh, it's use, basically you use it, you subscribe to data. And as you subscribe to the data, you're then able to come back time and time again. And the database engine using your subscription is able to identify you and you're then able to ask for what data has changed in the database since you were last connected. And it does this at a field level, record by record, table by table, and you can mix tables and bits together uh, and fields. Now subscriptions can run both during a connection or spanning time and connections. So you could connect to the database, grab all the information, commit your subscription, go away, work away in the middle of nowhere for a couple of days, come back in, reconnect to the database, and the database will know who you are, and it will know what's changed specifically in your subscription since you last asked for the data. So when you then fetch the changes, it will only give you what's changed. Now, we don't all have one device, we don't have one machine, we have multiple machines, we have multiple, you know, myself personally I'm sat here, I've got two tablets, my phone, my laptop, um, we all live with multiple devices now and as a subscriber to the database, uh, a subscriber in this term is an interface user, uh, so each interface user can have multiple devices, so the user and the device ID perform basically a primary key or unique key for the subscriptions. So if you have one subscriber or one database user and you then create a GUID for every single device out there, that will work, work absolutely fine. Uh, if you're using different levels of user security, then every user can have device IDs that are unique to them. Um, so you might call it phone or tablet or laptop um, and that would be fine because every different user would have then the ability to have the same names used. So let's look at the traditional way data is moved around and you know, this is really the problem that we're trying to address with change views. Typically briefcasing data is very important um, to be able to work offline um, which is something that's you know, often overlooked because of the challenges around it with mobilization projects. Um, but let's let's take a, a really simple example first off. Um, just going to briefcase some data. We're going to have a change made on the server and then we have to then fetch the the data set again because we don't know what's run out, what's changed. And as time goes by multiple changes happen centrally which means we have to do multiple fetches uh, and there's multiple times in here the same data has been collected. 
So even in this really, really simple example, we've got 23 data packets. And if we have a look here, the second item going across in both rows here has never changed. Well, if we clear out what we don't need to know down to what we just need to know, we're down to nine data packets rather than 23. Now imagine that second one is uh, a photo, then wow, that's a lot of data. That's way more data than the rest of them put together. But you get the idea that it's, you know, change views is about getting straight to specifically what you need to know. Now this opens the door to much more scalable and long lived briefcase models. Uh, it dramatically reduces the amount of data moving around. Data has a cost, especially on mobile projects. You know, data does cost money. And this also, uh, as we'll, we'll see as we go through, this is opening the door to something that traditional replication technologies would struggle to scale with. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. So how do the change views work? So basically, you create your subscription, and as you create your subscription, you tell it what data you're interested in monitoring, and you can monitor tables, or you can specify specific columns within a table that you want to track. And then once the subscription has been created, you're then able to grant access to those subscriptions to multiple users. And once they have the access to the subscription, then they can subscribe to it. And that's done through a SQL statement. So once it's set up in the database, any developer, if the subscription is available to the user that's connected in, then they can go and use it um, straight away. Not a problem. As I say, subscriptions can be a mix of tables and columns. Um, each user can have multiple devices. And one of the, the really key things here, um, traditional replication technologies struggle um, with bi-directional uh, replication to the point that um, it's quite common to have table locking or um, to have uh, log tables being used. And a big part of that is um, as you make a change on the database at the other end, if you're wanting to know what changes are made on that database, well, if you just made a change there, then that's going to get logged as a change. So that change is going to come back to you and you can end up in infinite loops. So one of the common techniques for avoiding those is to have specific database users for each replication target. And as that user logs in, the triggers on the database that then log the changes into a log table avoid then the trigger for going back to the source. So if um, database A has got some changes that it needs to tell database B about, as the changes are made into database B, the replication user that database A is using to connect to database B knows to not log those to go back to database A. So that's okay and that can work, but it's really not particularly scalable. And now imagine trying to connect 10,000 or 50,000 know, devices into a database and you're wanting to do some bi-directional data movement. You're then looking at 50,000 users. You're looking at 50,000 sets of triggers. You're looking at every one database change that's made, logging out 50,000 changes in essence. You can see that that really does become very unscalable very quickly. Um, so by using a change view, uh, the fact that it doesn't log those changes to go back to you is a, an immensely powerful feature. As I say, you can have your uh, change views running for as long or as short a period of time as you like. Um, and they're included in all the, the paid versions of Interbase. So what that means is we can have change views running out on mobile devices. We can have them running out on uh, well on Windows and Mac and iOS and Android. 
uh, and Linux as well. So you really can have you know the changes being tracked both on the device and off the device. Uh, and if you want to move the device changes back to the central server, you just create a subscription locally and you have a specific um, subscription device ID you could just call server. You can track it and then you can push that information back as you need to. Okay, so that's a, a brief overview of um, the change views. Now let's get into the more technical element of it and let's have a look at the language and uh, and we'll get to the point where we have a demo of it as well. So creating a subscription really is as simple as running a simple SQL statement. So a bit like creating a table, um, here we create subscription, uh, we give the subscription a name, so this subscription name is sub CEO multi device and the tables that we're interested in tracking here uh, we're interested in tracking the employee table the customer table and the uh, sales table and the department table however for whatever business reasons here we're interested in only tracking inserts updates and deletes on the employee and customer table for sales we're only interested in where something gets changed um, so it's updated and in the department table we're only interested in the location so we're only interested if the location field is changed in the department table and only if it's updated so I'm not even going to try and understand a use case for this one but you get the idea of how you can mix and match through um, field level and specific insert updates and deletes um, that you want to track now this can be really, really useful. You could have a change view that only tracked deleted records. Um, so by doing that, when the records are deleted, they're not, never going to disappear from the database. Um, they're not going to show in any of the queries or anything, but they're going to be there. Um, so you could have a, a special subscription that you use to connect back in uh, at points in time to find what data has been deleted by anybody. Um, kind of a hidden tracking method. method. Um, the other thing that you can do, and uh, it can be quite useful, is actually to run two subscriptions. Uh, now, thanks to, to FireDAC, this is really, really easy to do with the, the components um, in terms of the merging the inserts, updates, and deletes all together in one subscription. Um, but if you are using an interface that's maybe not um, Delphi or C++ uh, builder uh, orientated, then you can run two subscriptions, one for inserts and updates, and that will then provide you records that are live that have been modified and you can run a subscription specifically for deletes so you can then check for any records that have been deleted um, otherwise uh, you'll need to be able to check the the bits on the records to say if this is an insert update or deleted record um, so by separating the two out um, if you're using kind of PHP or um, Python or you know, something else to connect in that can be a, a very useful way to, to work out what's different So, so once you've created the subscription, the following step is to grant access to it. Now you can grant access to the subscription, uh, by default it's there for the database owner, um, but having, having the, the rights to track a specific subscription is a huge security benefit way beyond what log tables can provide. Now let me give you an example. Um, we do an awful lot of work with Interbase in Medical. Uh, and imagine that you have a field that is a HIV status. Now, if you're tracking patient changes or blood sample changes, and there's a subscription that allows you to track um, when that record changes, if that's going into a log table that's generally used by everybody, then that's quite easy to get to that data. Now that data may be encrypted, it may be restricted for viewing um, through user security. Uh, but if it's in the log tables, then, well, you can kind of get around that. Not with change views, because you have to have the rights to track the subscription. Only those people with rights and those who are subscribed will be able to identify what's actually changed on the records. So if you do want to keep secret when specific data is changing in the database, having a subscription that only specific users can use 
and have been granted subscribe on um, is very very powerful uh, so using a similar kind of method to uh, granting access to, to tables or uh, any other kind of standard SQL kind of um, elements uh, grant subscribe on subscription and then the subscription name and then uh, to and then you put the username or you can if you're using um, group level security you can use the group name uh, to, to subscribe uh, and grant you know, access to all the HR staff for example revoking ac um, access to the subscriptions is as simple as revoke subscribe on subscription subscription name and then from the username or group of users So we've got our subscription, we've got access to the subscription. Now as a developer all I need to do to connect to the subscription and use it is I need to be running a transaction and the transaction needs to be in snapshot isolation and we're then able to run uh, the first SQL statement in our subscription, uh, inside our transaction is set subscribe, then our subscription name at and then the device ID that you want to use and now that will take up to a GUID so um, you can generate a GUID and shove it in there if you want to um, so yeah set subscribe subscription name at device ID active and what that does is it then says hello database it's me with this device I only want to know about the changes so the first time you run a select statement, you're going to get everything. You will get everything returned because you've never collected data under that subscription before. So once you fetch that data, you can commit your transaction. And then later on, you can reconnect. You can set your subscription active again. And then when you run the same SQL command, you'll get only what's changed. So we've got a specific command here, select department and location from the department table where the department number equals 180. So that's going to fetch only um, departments where it's 180. That's fine. Now let's imagine that we're changing the department and we're changing it to Austin, Texas. Now, as we make that change, because we're within an active subscription, we're not going to get told about that change coming back to us. So anybody else who connects in will get told about it, but because we're within a subscription, that change isn't reported back because it knows we know about it already. Why tell us what we already know? It's just more data to move around unnecessarily. So the first statement would obviously pick up the departments. The second statement there will update the record. And the third one, if you run that as a third example, would then just pick up anything that's been changed by anybody else apart from us. Now there's uh, five tables. Um, if you're interested in the underneath gubbings of it all, um, the RDB dollar tables or the, the database system tables. There's uh, the subscriptions, which defines the, the change views that have been created. So if you want to go and actually have a look at those in, in depth, then you can go and have a look at the RDB dollar subscriptions table. Then there's the RDB dollar subscribers table. Now the RDB dollar subscribers, uh, every user and their device ID generates a record in there. So if you do need to go and remove uh, a subscriber manually, uh, you can do that through that table there. Uh, you can also use the RDB dollar subscribers table to view and work out what subscribers to the database have been fetching data and which ones haven't. So if you know you've got remote devices that you're trying to monitor, then you can do that centrally through the RDB dollar subscribers table and um, pick up which ones have actually been and fetch the data and which ones haven't. 
um, the relations, relation fields, and user privileges, then are just defining the, the details of um, the subscriptions uh, and who's got access to those subscriptions. Okay, so let's have a, a demo of change views in action. Okay, so I'm going to just jump in to, to RAS Studio. Now there's uh, a sample for both Delphi and C++ in the samples directory. So if we just go to open sample projects, it's in the same place for C++ and Object Pascal. Um, it's in the database FireDAC samples. And this is a DBMS specific sample for interbase for change views and there's a generic one here which uh, is great for seeing how the FIDAC components work with the um, notifications that you can run through Interbase as changes are made centrally you can set a notification and that will alert the client that something's changed in a specific um, table that it's interested in um, and there's also this pharmacy demo and um, the pharmacy demo the project group here has three projects in here there's the data merge project which is um, an application that was written to take data from a Microsoft SQL Server database and merge it field by field record by record into an interbase database uh, and that was a central point for a proof of concept that um, we were uh, running with a, a customer on change views um, specifically uh, and that customer had 30,000 remote locations that it needs to keep up to date um, with drug information and uh, the SQL Server database just couldn't manage the uh, the scalability around the replication that they needed to do. So what they did is actually from an architectural point um, they're keeping the Microsoft SQL Server database because it's so tightly embedded with the rest of their systems but put an interface database next to it that they're then able to update and then all of the remote locations are then able to connect into the uh, into the interbase database and ask for what's changed. So um, what I've done is I've uh, I've actually created some shortcuts here, but I've done a, a little trick. Um, this application creates uh, an ini file as you run it. So I've, I've run it both as release and um, debug. And uh, when you go to install this as a, a data folder here, uh, you'll need to go and put these databases into C data. Um, but uh, then once you run it first time, uh, you can come in here and just modify the any file to point uh, to a specific location you want. So here I've got one pointing at pharmacy two, um, and that's the debug, uh, and then the, the release build. Um, I just pointed at a different database, which is um, the, pharm the pharmacy one. So they're both pointing at the same central database, which is this one here. So this is just a, a simple database viewer um, where we've got three tables. I've got a, a categories, medicine, and then uh, a link table that says which medicines belong in which categories. And then pharmacy one, pharmacy two, which is just basically the, the same data just but running two different applications. So we can see here we've got pharmacy one, and this one's pharmacy two. So the data here is just taken straight from the database. And um, we can see we've got different customers in, in each database. So I'm just going to go and use the data updates part here because that's really what we're interested in. So I'm just going to do fetch deltas. And this is the local table. And we can see here there's no deltas for either of these tables here. And the same over here. So let's go and make some changes. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and let's make this allergies. And I'm going to head and change something over here just because I can. So we've now got uh, the data updated centrally. Um, I'm going to use this show merged here, which is basically uh, going to fetch the local data and then merge the delta on top of it 
Uh, and then we can see here field level specifically what's been changed. So we can see allergies has been changed here. And on this record here, we can see that the, the name has been changed as well. Uh, if I go ahead and just do the fetch deltas on this one without the showing merged, we can see specifically that the, the data returned is just the, the records that have been modified. So let's go ahead and I'm going to post those changes into Pharmacy 1 but leave them pending in Pharmacy 2 for the moment. And let's just come back here and I'm going to make uh, another change. Uh, I'm actually going to change this back. And I'm going to go and change another record, which is the one that I should have changed. And yeah, that'll do for now. So let's go ahead and fetch the changes here. We can see nothing's changed on the categories. We have now got a couple of changes made here. And if I go and fetch the deltas. Now, we know two changes have happened here because this one's changed and this one here uh, has changed. So we do see two records. Over here, we've not committed those records in yet. You know, we can still see that the original changes are not being committed in. You know, we've done a select against them, we haven't done a commit. Uh, and that's actually really quite useful because you can do a select statement. You could do a select count from table to find out how many records have changed before going, actually, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab those now. Um, but although it's changed back, it's still been changed. So it's important to know that it's been changed. But it's been checked, you know, this record's been modified a couple of times. In fact, we could go back and modify it again. It'll still just keep rocking up just the once. Uh, and that's important because when you use traditional logging, you're going to get multiple records. And if you change something three or four times, it's going to appear three or four times in the log for each destination. Um, change view just consolidates that and says, right, this record's changed, here's the current value. The rest of the stuff in between, we don't care about. Um, so it's, you know, because we're not using logging and um, traditional log tables, uh, this isn't an audit system, but it's, um, you know, it's much more efficient and precise and to the point. Okay, so that's, that's change views in action. Let's jump in and have a look at the, the code for that. Okay, so the, the key point really to this um, demo is this data module deltas here. And um, the rest is just showing the data and frames for showing the data and so on. And here we have three queries which are pointing at the local tables. We have three queries that are running the same SQL statement, but they're connected to the snapshot transaction, um, which is defaulted to roll back. And there's a query here that runs that first command that sets subscription active for the device ID. Uh, and then just for the output for the demo, there's some uh, in-memory tables that are used to take the local data and the deltas and merge them together. And that's what you were seeing, the, the output from those. Um, but the final updates and posts to the local databases using the local query and then applying these deltas into it um, before it's then posted. So let's have a quick look at the, the code under here. I keep forgetting that Windows 10 has got some key pushes that have changed. Um, so I'm still trying to rework out the mappings. So anyway, here's um, the open all, which is the um, run on the, the demos, uh, data module creation. Um, the local query is going to cached update modes. Um, we then open the local queries. We then check that our remote database transaction isn't active. If it is, we roll it back. And we then just start a fresh transaction against the remote database. We then set the subscription uh, for the medicine updates at the device ID active. We execute that. That's all we do. We just run it as a SQL statement. And then we then run the open command uh, on the remote data queries and um, we can see here that uh, as the data module is created both the local and the remote are being set up with the same SQL statements. 
to merge the data. It really is just as simple as running this really cool uh, feature that was introduced in XE8 called Merge Dataset. Um, so using FIDAC you can run this, uh, you can take the source um, for the local one, um, do the merge data set and then you pass in the delta and here uh, you just tell it you're doing a delta merge into this data set and that's it, you then just apply updates um, we're then all up to date so we're able to commit the remote transaction uh, and then we just notify the screen that it's um, to go reload the, the local data sets and off it goes so that is literally all you need to know from CodePoint and um, just jumping back, here's the, um, the C++ version of that data module. Um, I say, so it is there, just go ahead and have a look at it. Same kind of thing, just actually setting up the queries. They're all pointing at the same SQL statements, setting the cached updates. Uh, it's literally dots for dashes, arrows, um, and uh, using the same FIDAC components, using the same merge dataset properties. And using the same merge data modes um, with the, the delta merge um, for adding the deltas into the memory table and this just puts the initial data set in and then the deltas on top of it um, so that's exactly the same and then the post updates being uh, exactly the same thing again just taking the local query and posting the, the deltas in from uh, a database point uh, in Ivy Console, you can come in here, you can see the subscriptions, you can see the SQL for them, you can see the permissions that have been granted through them, um, and that is literally what you need to, be, to do um, if you want to kind of find out what subscriptions are set up on a database. So I just want to finish off with um, why change views. Let's say I've kind of alluded to a few of these as we've kind of gone through really, but um, you know, one of the traditional ways for tracking changes is using triggers, database triggers, and especially as they scale out, um, they can be very high cost at runtime. Um, the example we've just seen with the pharmacy demo, um, you know, with 30,000 destinations to keep up to date, uh, you've got insert, update and delete triggers on every single table. Um, that's a lot of triggers to manage and especially when you've got to have triggers if you're doing any bi-directional data um, where you have specific checks to make sure you don't end up in circular replication um, so yeah it's um, yeah it can be quite a lot of cost at runtime to have triggers there triggers also uh, using triggers uh, and log tables really do verbose out database logs very, very quickly. Also, having a long log where you might have the same record in there 10, 20 times isn't very efficient. Um, it also makes it very hard to query exactly what has changed. Uh, so typically, you know, using triggers, they're running at um, record level as well because trying to track every single field um, just makes it even more confusing and um, verbose. Um, so the level of detail isn't anywhere near as what near what you're going to get with change views. So hence triggers are really suited to small scale synchronization and replication jobs. With change views um, we have near zero database speed effect. Uh, in fact it's, it is pretty much zero. Um, minimal on disk size um, taken up by using change views. Uh, it's just a few records. We have field level granularity, so rather than record level, we know right down to the field of specifically what's changed. And as a developer, when you query the database um, remotely and you fetch the changes, knowing specifically what has changed can add so much more power and opportunity to you in terms of what you present to the end user. Uh, and how you make them interact with the system, um, it really does open up a, a you know, especially when you kind of got uh, conflict resolution, uh, being able to identify specifically what records have changed on the field level, um, really does help you consolidate and, and work out how the changes should be merged together um, programmatically. 
Also, Change Views has some additional SQL uh, language features, um, so you can query for um, where fields are same or are not same. Um, so, have a look at the language guide. We'll take you through those. Um, but that's that's great. You know, you can query select star from table where field is not same, and that will that will then restrict the delta view just down to the specific um, field that you're interested in at that point in time. And also change views are highly scalable, highly, highly scalable. Um, date fields is one of the other traditional approaches used. Um, date fields are, are fine. Um, they kind of they do verbose out the database. You do end up with redundant fields that you don't really need. Um, again, date fields typically used at record level. Uh, if you want to track specific data at date field level, then you need to have specific date fields for those fields as well. So every field becomes two fields in the database. So they do increase you know, your disk usage. They do increase the complexity of management because you then have to have triggers or code in place within the database to actually modify the date field at the point that it's changed uh, or you need to put it into your business logic which is an absolute you know well you can but I really wouldn't recommend that um, the other thing with date fields is simultaneous user updates can really cause issues if you're updating uh, 10,000 records and in the middle somebody comes in and updates one record are you going to find that record? You know, the date field is going to be stamped smack in the middle of your transact, you know, your your times. Um, you know, so things can get lost. You also end up with problems around date time changes. Um, if the the you know the battery goes on the PC and the date goes wonky, or um, somebody inadvertently changes the the time on the machine, or uh, you have time zone changes where the the dates and time jumps back um, you, know, you can accidentally end up losing a whole hour's worth of work very easily um, so it can be very hard and you know quite often when you're using date fields people often go into the point where they lock tables so only a single user can be actually accessing the table at the point it's being updated um, which can cause a, a real bottleneck and um, with change views near zero database speed effect um, really really super easy to add after you've done all your database design and development you don't need to go back and say right I need to actually add in fields now to track this which I've then got to um, kind of track with as well there's also um, you know, there's no metadata changes so uh, you can filter your changes through um, uh, SQL much easier and simpler and because it's all run within an ACID compliant configuration um, you can have multiple users accessing and writing to the table at the same time um, and when you reconnect your subscription you'll find out those changes that have happened in the time that you've been making your changes so um, you'll never miss a change made to the database again So if you're interested in finding out more about change views and the pros and cons there, uh, a bit more about the pharmacy story, um, I definitely recommend downloading the, the change views white paper. If you uh, forget the URL, um, which is the short URL that's up on the screen there, then just go to the Interpace page. Uh, Interpace uh, product page is on the Embarcadero website. You'll be able to um, see it on the right hand side, just uh, look for this kind of little icon. Uh, and you'll be able to download that quite easily. Um, the key thing really, field level granularity, no log tables, no triggers, no additional users to set up, no need to add timestamp fields for doing any tracking into your database, um, no table locking, no worries about time zones, it's just really super highly scalable um, and very very easy to manage. So, 
thank you very much for joining us and listening through this session. Um, it now, if you're watching this live, uh, we're going to open up for some live Q&A. Uh, if not, then please feel free to follow Interbase on Twitter. Um, you can ask your questions directly there or um, you can message me at Delphiable. But now, Q&A. Okay, David, I here, and Stephen, are you there? I, I am indeed, David. There's a, a, ch a change views video that Stephen did, and there are other videos that are interface related, like uh, Matt building master detail app with interface to go, uh, and so on. IB console, and and all those different videos are are product demos that are out on the video tab of interface, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to the. Um, and there's Interspace Labs um, linked on the, uh, the Interspace page as well, which has got a whole stack of little videos showing you how to use um, domains and triggers, sort of procedures, and uh, all that kind of stuff as well, which is great. Yep, that's down at the bottom, so I'm pasting that, Interface Labs. And then the tutorials, there's a tutorial link. Is that on the doc wiki or? Oh, that goes to Interbase Labs as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in the chat window as well, everyone, there's a link to... Uh, database in action slash interbase hyphen labs so you'll see that let's get to the questions how different is change views from merge subscription on a SQL Microsoft SQL server um, yeah much uh, the, the most stuff that SQL server has um, is basically a way for you to try and um, it, it's a traditional replication type of engine using triggers um, and, and logs to be able to work their way through um, from having a look through the, the stuff that Microsoft got set up there, then it's it's a bit more involved um, than using uh, a change view. Um, the, I think the, the key thing here is that you know change views isn't an auditing system. You know we're not going to tell you all the values it's been and who changed the values all the way through time. Um, if you want to do that, then put triggers on the table. Um, but you should only need one set of triggers. Um, when you're moving data between multiple different locations. Um, and you'll be able to learn more about this through the Change Views white paper. Um, to, one of the big problems around replication is that as you make a change on a remote database, if you wanted to get the changes come back, you need to be able to filter out the changes you make so you don't get told about them, because otherwise the changes have been made back in your database, and then there'll be logs that's being changed, and then they're going to go back, and they end up going in the loop. Um, with, uh, with Change Views, um, you don't need to, to worry about having to set up different database users or different triggers for different destinations. Um, you just subscribe and it will take care of that for you using the device ID that's passed through. Um, but because of that, we're not tracking all the values over time. We don't care. We just want to say, this record's changed. Here's the latest details on it. You've got what you've got. We've got what's here, what's changed. If you've made a change locally and there's a change remotely, hey, you've got a conflict. Deal with it. Um, so, you know, we cut through all the noise. Um, we don't want to kind of say, well, this record's changed 20 times, so I'm going to tell you 20 times about it. Um, we consolidate everything down so you can just get right to the nuts and bolts about what you need to know about um, having changed. Um, and because of that, because there's no log tables, because there's no triggers, um, it means it becomes hugely scalable in a way that other technologies just can't do, which is why, going back to that pharmacy story, where they had 30,000 pharmacies to, to replicate the data to, you know, they've tried. They can't manage that with, um, with existing technologies, which is why they're looking to put a copy of Interface alongside their SQL Server um, to actually then have the remote devices connecting in to ask Interface what's changed, because that can manage that. Excellent. Um... Here's a different question, perhaps a little different than change views, but related. What is the best way to track all changes to the database, including who made the change for audit tracking purposes? Um, yeah, I think that was kind of a follow-on from the, the previous question. Um, but just back to the, the comment, if you want to do auditing, um, put in some triggers. Um, InSpace tells you which user is connected. So as long as you're giving different usernames to the people who are connecting in, then you can go ahead and you can use that within a trigger. So after uh, update, you can find out what's changed. You can then log that as you want to to a log table. Okay, and then uh, which version of Interbase can be a publisher and can IB Lite subscribe to IB or IB2Go version? Okay, so 
any um, interface to go, uh, interface desktop, uh, interface server. They can all have change views running in them. And you can uh, use interface to go locally to connect to only, so it doesn't allow remote connections in. Uh, but what you can do is on a mobile application, if you've got InSpace to go in there, you could have a user, you talk, you can create a subscription um, within a transaction uh, and tell it that the device ID is the remote server. And then you can fetch the changes locally and the local device can then pick up the, the, the changes that have been happened remotely and then pass that back to the remote server. Um, you know, on a mobile uh, architecture, it's impossible to have fixed endpoints that the remote, uh, the remote server is kind of connecting into, um, so it really has to be a, a push from the, from the mobile device. So it's really easy to do that with change view locally. Um, and then the same um, machine can then use Interface to go as a client driver to talk directly to a remote server, um, or you can pack it up and pass it through kind of REST clients if you want to. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's the way that you do that. So yeah, use Interface to go with a, with a subscription, have a, another subscription on the, on the server, and then just connect and work with those that way. And is uh, ChangeView is also on uh, Interbase Linux? It's cross-platform. Okay, so if you've got server or to go, uh, XZ7, you've got ChangeViews, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it doesn't need to be going into an Interbase database on the other end. You could be using whatever anywhere. Um, you could be storing the data in an XML file for all I care. Um, obviously using Interbase to go on the client side um, then provides you all the, you know, the security, the encryption, the change view technologies all built in so it's much easier to programmatically move data back and forth and you're using the same data structures on both ends so it makes, you know, once you've got your data model sorted it's really, really easy to get it out across the platforms. Um, but you could, you know, uh, if you're only caching small amounts of data, then you, know, you could put it into an Ivy Lite database. It's not a problem. Um, if it's a, a one-way push of the server data out to the client. Um, so you're really, really kind of flexible. And here's another question. Is conflict resolution managed automatically by Interbase? So what you can do is you can ask for what's changed. And once you get that, you can then check locally what's changed and you've then got the ability to then work out how you manage that conflict. Um, FIDAC will give you row level um, details of that uh, and I believe um, you can actually uh, use the uh, conflict resolution that's built into the FIDAC components. I, I must admit I've not tested it um, uh, to check but um, there is stuff within FIDAC for already doing conflict resolution, a bit like there was on your client data set. Um, so, uh, that would be my first step would be to go and check that some kind of stuff out. But certainly it's doable because you know what you change locally, you know what's changed remotely. Um, it's then just compare and merge. Okay, Jay is saying he's got RAD uh, 10 Seattle to test. I don't know, if, I guess that may be, the, he's saying he's got the trial or the product. What mm -hmm. extra is required for Interbase licenses? So you get an Interbase developer edition shipped with the product. That can use change views, um, so you're ready to go. Um, just go and make sure you've started your Interbase server, and you'll be able to find that through the Start Programs um, menu. And um, yeah, that's what you need to do. Just make sure Interbase server is running. Go create your database, create your subscription. Off you go. You're ready to use change views. Um, you can, if you're not using Raz Studio, go and download a free developer edition from the website. And uh, also, if you want to use the um, trial edition, that will give you 90 days with 20 users, um, allowing you to test up to 80 concurrent connections. Um, so you can go ahead and use that as well. So plenty of choice. And that's the Interbase trial, right? The Interbase server trial? Yeah. yeah, so if you're if you're wanting to kind of do your development stuff and then test it on a, um, on a production machine internally for uh, a week or so as you're, you're putting stuff together, then you can use the trial edition to do that. Um, but um, obviously, the, that's you know one of the key things I would say is it's probably worth having a look at that point. Um, if you're developing applications you're going to be selling, um, get in contact with our, our sales guys and um, look at the SDK pack, um, and that provides you with some 
licenses that give you um, more um, permission to do you know, selling and testing and um, uh, of your applications and also kind of gets you the first step into getting the bar program, which then helps you silently embed into those um, directly inside your applications uh, without having to go and get the licenses every time before you go and deploy out. Um, so it kind of works a bit more like a, pre a prepaid telephone contract or one that you would put pay monthly at the end of the, of the month kind of thing. So you know, rather than having to go to the shop every time you need to deploy out a new license, um, the VAR program is there to help make that really, really super easy for you. And, and when you purchase 10 Seattle, I think you'll get the license purchase in addition. You'll get you get the license key for the IDE for you know C plus plus Builder Delphi or Red Studio. And don't you get a couple yep. of your base licenses like the IB Lite yeah. license, right? Yeah, get an IB Lite license so you can use that for free in your applications. Um, you also get a trial license for Interface to go, um, so you can. Um, go to the reg.marketera.com and put in the trial key and that will then give you a slip file that you can then put into your machine um, and that goes to public documents in Barcadero interface um, and there's a folder there you just put the license in there um, and uh, you're then ready to start testing um, you can just call, uh, rename it as you save it down to reg underscore IB to go um, and that will automatically pick up uh, when you use the interface feature through the deployment options in the IDE. So as you create a project, if you're using interface, uh, go to the project deployment options. Uh, in there, the features, turn on interface, and you'll be able to see if you've got the, the license file in the right location, because it will be um, in a normal color. If it's not available, it'll be kind of grayed out. Um, and then as soon as that license is there, just build and run your application and it will package it up, put the license with it, and you can then go and run that on Windows, on Mac, on iOS and Android, uh, and test your applications running everywhere. And, and if it's grayed out or if you need to put your license file somewhere else for some reason, just project deployment, uh, go and hit the little plus icon and add yep. and navigate to where your license file is and then go over to the remote column and where you need to deploy it. Um, for IB Lite, for example, or, or iOS, Android, for iOS, you're going to want to put it in, it's something like startup documents, uh, interbase slash license or something like that, you know, but you'll see this. Yeah, basically just don't copy the one from the other path. Mm -hmm. You'll see the, the sample path. I think it's dot assets on Android and so on. But yeah. you'll see the paths for the default one when you click to add the interface feature files and then uh, you'll see the pattern even if you have to go and uncheck one of the license file there and add another license file. You'll see the deploy patterns for all the different target platforms. So it's really straightforward in the project deployment uh, dialog box. Yeah, and in fact I, I covered sessions um, going over that kind of stuff in one of our previous code pages. Um, talking about uh, taking data out to mobile with IB Lights and Go. So um, definitely go and have a look at that. I'll show you how you go get the license and put it on the machine. Yeah, I'm going to copy that video URL into the chat window for the okay, great. building a master detail app with IB Light and Interbase to Go. I think it was that one. Um, no, it wasn't that one. I'll, I think it might actually come from my blog as well. I'll just see if I can find it. Okay, or there's another one, how to embed. Oh, that was Marco. Okay, but if you have it, put it in the chat window, Stephen, for everybody to have it. And then I'm giving all those links to Brian so he can paste them into the the resource blog that he's that he's uh, curating for us. Okay, Stephen, uh, thanks for the back-to-back -back sessions. Any last words? I won't kick you out. Uh, we just keep going till 5 p.m. But uh, if you find the link to that specific video, put it in the chair. It is. So, yeah. oh, it's over off your blog, a link off your blog. It was from last mm -hmm. week's Code Rage Night. Great. And that's about uh, showing you the, all the steps of creating a, a, a multi-device mobile app with interface and license keys and project deployments. Cool. So, Stephen, any last uh, quick words before I get ready to switch over to the next session, which is uh, Beacon Fence and building uh, beacon-based and beacon-fenced uh, applications? 
Um, the only thing I'd really say is that you know it's um, it's great fun um, with Interface at the moment, getting all the stuff together. There's been some great case stories that we've been putting together um, this last year. Um, we love hearing what you're doing. Um, it gives the, the engineering team a real buzz to hear the, the great stuff that you guys are doing out there. Um, I've had the great fortune of being um, out around with a whole load of the, the Rad Studio um, events recently uh, and seeing um, one of the InSpace customers who's producing you know, lab equipment that they're kind of sampling you know, 5,000 petri dishes, taking images over the hours to see how the stuff's growing and get the drugs available and to go back to the labs. And um, you know, We love hearing the stories of what you guys are doing, um, so please do just kind of send us a note over to say, hey, we're doing this with it. Um, you know, change views is relatively new out, so we, you know, it's, we've heard a couple of really nice stories about that already, um, but anything new around that that you're doing or you're planning to do, um, share with us. We're more than happy you know, to kind of give you some feedback about things maybe to look out for along the way, but um, you know, that stuff really does make a, you know, a, a big difference. You know, we love being able to share your stories, um, so please do kind of pass those through. So you'll see uh, Jay's last messages. Uh... They, he does, uh, they do retail point of sale solutions. So I said perfect target solution and just for, for Interbase. And yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. Gave your email address. And so uh, uh, absolutely, uh, Jay, contact Stephen. Stephen and everybody, thank you very much. We're going to, uh, let's see, we're going to switch. So thanks, Stephen. Cheers, David. Okay, and then everyone. We're